80% of Americans suffer with some sort of digestive complaint, whether it's constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel, Crohn's, colitis, diverticulitis. And so what's happening is we're having this GI epidemic that's swooping everybody and throwing everybody under the bus. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Doc Jock Show. Today, we're going to be talking about irritable bowel syndrome. This is something that I was plagued with and many of my patients were also plagued with throughout the course of my you know, history with treating patients. Now, what's interesting is when people come to me with irritable bowel complaints, I'm not the first stop. Never in the history of any time have I ever been the first doc called. However, I should have been because we get phenomenal results whenever it comes to irritable bowel, Crohn's, colitis, whatever digestive complaints you could think of. And the reason that we get those results is because we're able to take a whole holistic approach for what's going on in your body that's causing you to have some sort of dis-ease. Okay, so here's why. It's really important to work with a functional medicine practitioner, naturopathic health expert, somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about. When you go into a medical office, you go into a GI specialist, a gastroenterologist, or whatever ist you go to, what they're going to do is categorize your symptoms and throw it into a syndrome. And all they're doing is saying, I don't know what's really causing this, but it sounds like you've got this, this categorization of symptoms. Now you're clustered and now there's a whole host of medications that I can give you. When in fact, medications can be one of the causes of irritable bowel to begin with. Now, digestive complaints, about 80% of Americans suffer with some sort of digestive complaint, whether it's constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel, Crohn's, colitis, diverticulitis. And so what's happening is we're having this, this GI epidemic that's swooping everybody and throwing everybody under the bus. And so what's happening is we can't, we can't keep living the same ways that, that we thought that we could get away with. It's not working anymore. We're getting caught. Our food source isn't the same. We've got glyphosate in there. It's causing massive issues with irritable bowel, got permeability, triggering autoimmunity, and I'm not laughing about it, but it's triggering autoimmunity. It's doing all these things to our bodies that we just continue to subject ourselves to, and it's not helping us. The other piece that GI docs are going to be missing, one, they don't know how to test properly. They're only going to test to medicate. The other piece of this is what if you've got constipation five days out of the week, then Saturday rolls around, guess what? You have a bowel movement. You have another one. You have another one. You have another one. You have like four or five bowel movements in one day, and you're like, Oh, thank God I made it to the end of the week. I haven't pooped all week, but now it's Saturday and I can poop. You know, it's not hard to put two and two together. That's something your job is causing you not to be able to have a bowel movement or something that you're eating while you're at work is causing you to not have a bowel movement. The amount of people that I've worked with, with this particular type of scenario is not uncommon. It's not uncommon at all. It's actually a lot more common than you would probably think. And it's the stress that comes with the job. Sunday, you know, Sunday comes around and you're stressing already about what's going to happen on Monday. Monday comes around and you're so, you're so uptight, you're so high strung that what's happening is, is we're causing this state of fight or flight. When we're in that state of fight or flight, we're putting all the function or taking all the function away from your digestive and reproductive organs and we're throwing it out into your skeletal muscle. So your biceps, triceps, legs, you know, your quads, your lower legs, your calves, your shoulders, your arms. All right, your eyesight, everything is going to be heightened as if you were being attacked by a bear. It's not good for digestion. Think about this. You can try this experiment, right? Go ahead and try to sit down for a meal for breakfast and then try to drink 200, 300 milligrams of caffeine. Okay, try it. Try it in a healthy perspective. There's something called smart energy that you can try. I think it's like 200 milligrams of caffeine per little gel cap with some MCTs in it. But try that or try drinking multiple cups of coffee. In fact, a lot of people will say that the only reason that they have bowel movements in the morning is because of their cup of coffee. So what is actually going on 
in these scenarios. What's happening is we eat food, we throw in a bunch of caffeine, which is a fake stress, right? It induces stress in our body, and then it pulls all the function away from your digestive organs, and then you rock it one out in the morning. It's been like that for a lot of people who like clockwork for many, 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 many years. And so that's their morning routine. Cup of coffee, have a poop, go about your day. Or, you know, it, that's, that's even without food. Or you'll, you'll go and you'll have a, a donut or who knows, some pastry or something. You're going to get a Starbucks. You're going to drink some cappuccino with some milk in it. And you're going to throw that all in there. And all of a sudden, boom, you lose your bowels again. You're like, hey, I pooped today. Or you do that a couple of times a day. You're like, oh, I pooped twice. Well, you had a medically induced poop, more or less. Right? You had a stress-induced poop. But the other side of things is you could be so tight, and this can lead to that constipation. You're so stressed out that every single thing in you is holding on to that stress. So you're holding on to those bowels, and you're not letting them out until you go ahead and, and, and calm down at the end of the week. Side tangent of this one. This is... There's a little history of me. So I used to love smoking cigars until I had H. pylori and then cigars just completely wrecked me. Unless it's on like an incredibly special occasion, I'll have a cigar. Now cigars have nicotine in them, so do cigarettes. Now when you're smoking a cigar, you're smoking a cigarette, a lot of people, right, will be relaxed enough and then they'll have a bowel movement. You know, it was, pretty, it was pretty common for me that I would sit down and be like, all right, perfect. Let's start smoking this little cigar, doing it, doing it, doing it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, got to take a poop. Got to go poop now. Why? I was in a state of relaxation. When I was relaxed, my digestive organs had more function to them, and I was able to pass through better bowel movements, right? So there's something to nicotine. Nicotine by itself is a smart drug. It is a nootropic. So it does help with brain function. It does help at um, accelerating just overall brain function. What's bad is what they put it in, right? All the, the carcinogens and stuff that are actually in cigarettes, cigars, et cetera, right? So why am I talking about all this? So I'm talking about just different things that we can be doing, th different things that we can be taking on a daily basis that can be triggering our irritable bowel. Is it coming from stress? Do you have a stressful job? Do you have a stressful relationship? Did you just lose a dog? Did you just have something traumatic happen in your life? You know, are you not sleeping? And that's causing you to be stressed out. These are all questions that need to be answered, not just for irritable bowel or digestive issues, but really for everyone. But this is what makes us different. This is what makes us unique is we ask these questions because we've seen it. We've seen the studies, we've seen the actual case studies that we have with patients that we work with. And when we're seeing these results, we're like, man, you're just super stressed out. You're so stressed. Let's calm you down. And bowels are working phenomenally. Another stressed out scenario. I go and I go up to you and I say, listen, Johnny, you're going to be doing a, a talk in front of 6,000 people on a topic that you have no idea what it's going to be or how long it's gonna be, but you're gonna to have to get up there on stage and talk in front of those people. You good with that? What happens to most people's stomach? Most people's stomach starts, they start getting butterflies, they start getting nervous, they start getting nauseous. They're, That's your stress response immediately communicating to your digestive organs. So this stuff is pretty common. I mean, it's pretty much common sense. It's very logical with why we may be feeling a certain way, right? What is our current state of stress? Let's go into another stress. What does our dietary stress looks like? This is before we even do any testing, right? This is just evaluation. This is proper health history to see why you're in this current state. If your dietary history is, you know, you're not eating any fiber at all during a day, you're like, I'm constipated. I'm like, well, no, no shit. You don't have any fiber. You don't have any of those, the roughage to basically help to pull some of that stuff out. Okay. What if you're just pounding down processed sugar, baked goods? dairy, all those sugary, horrible inflammatory foods, you're more than likely going to be building up some good candida growth in your gut. Therefore, you're going to have yourself a nice internal infection. Candida, in my experience, causes a lot of constipation, a lot of bloat, a lot of irritable bowel type disorders. Plus, it pushes up estrogen, which can also cause bowel disorders as well. So when we're dealing with this, and then we have inflammation that's found in our gut, right, just from, you know, stress, then we have dietary stress. We have an alteration of our gut microbiome, 
And if that happens, our perception of stress tends to be the whole making a mountain out of a molehill. And so that's going to compound more stress on top of your already damaged body, right? Your dis-ease, your body is in dis-ease. It's not at ease. So we talk about the dietary side of things. Are you, are you eating gluten? You know, my, my big ones, you, you guys know this, is, is gluten, corn, dairy, soy, right? If we eat these things, we cannot expect to be healthy. It's as simple as that. There's no excuses. There's no, oh, this gluten is better than that gluten. And this way, the gluten is prepared is better than this way. I don't, no, it's not. No, it's not. You either eat or you don't. You either be healthy or you're not. And if you choose to eat something that's inflammatory, know that there's going to be inflammation that comes with it. You can't be pissed off at your body for falling apart because you want to eat that pizza every single night. It's your fault. Stop it. So we got the Overall stress is right. The, the relational, the, the job stress. We moved into the, the dietary stress. Are we not eating? Are we eating too much? Are we eating too little? Are we in a calorie deficit? And what's going to happen? What's going to happen is if, as we continue to do that, you're going to create this constant state of stress. Your primitive survival is going to kick in. What's that going to do? Cause you to store and gain fat on top of having ear of bowel. So you're just adding into this bloat, this bloating concoction, right? Which again, if you've ever been to a GI specialist, which I even hesitate to call them specialists, they're just GI doctors. They pigeonhole themselves in, in treatment with medications. If you've ever gone to one, when was the last time they asked these questions? They don't. They say, how is that medication working for you? Do you need another medication? Do you have any other symptoms that we need to treat due to that medication? Right, and I have a whole list over here of medications that can trigger irritable bowel. All right, so opioids, this is something that I know all too well. When I got jumped in 2009, they put me on some heavy duty opioids. I was on a morphine drip for three days in intensive care and didn't really eat much of anything. And I remember when I got out of the hospital, they gave me the, the painkillers and then they gave me this little red pill and was like, you're going to need this. I'm like, what the hell is this? So I'm taking my painkillers, taking my painkillers because my brain was basically exploding inside of my skull, taking these painkillers. I'm like, I'm not pooping at all. Like, what the heck is going on? You take the red pill, whoom, liquid diarrhea. You're like, huh. all right. They gave me this because they knew that opioids are going to cause a constipated type state or it's going to cause an issue with irritable bowel. Therefore, we have this opioid epidemic that's out there. People are pounding down opioids more than ever. And they're going to have more than ever digestive complaints. And we're seeing opioids combined with suicide, depression, mood disorders. Well, it's damaging your gut. And when you damage your gut, you're never going to feel happy. You're not going to feel up to par, up to snuff. You're always going to feel like you're inflamed. And that inflammation is going to go into the brain and cause you to have other type of neurotransmitter issues, issues with serotonin, issues with dopamine production. You're going to get into that chronic stress state, that fight or flight, anxiousness, bipolarness, Alzheimer's, type 3 diabetes, but they're also linking it to chronic stress, a chronic stress response. So we're building this into our lifestyles every single day with everything that we choose. So when someone's like, oh, I just took a little bit of this or a little bit of that, well, you just damaged your gut a little bit. Recognize that. Recognize it. I'm not going to validate it. I'm going to recognize it and say, listen, we're going to have to clean up the mess of you doing that, right? And what's the other thing people take all the time? Antibiotics, right? And I just had a conversation with a patient the other day. He just started care and he got some sort of a pneumonia type strain before he started care with me. He went and got put on some heavy duty antibiotics, did all this other stuff. And I'm like, well, at least you did it before we started the program. So that way we can repair the damage that was done from that antibiotic. Because no antibiotic is immune to damaging the body. They all crush the body. So we built from there, right? So we go from the external stresses, right? The spiritual stress or the spiritual attacks that we can get, the emotional stress, the relational stress, the job stress, go into the dietary stress. Then we go into, are you drinking enough water? Which is one of the, to me, is one of the biggest issues that I, that I got to deal with this year is, is teaching people that they need to drink water, which I didn't think was going to be a big deal. But, you know, with people working as hard as they do nowadays, they, they don't have time to eat, quote unquote. They don't have time to eat. They don't have time to even remember to drink water. So we're trying to quantify this stuff. So a little tip, if you're listening to this, you're like, I struggle with water all the time. You want to have at least half your body weight in ounces. 
right? So if you weigh 200 pounds, okay, I'm just going to round it at 200 pounds, you need about 100 ounces of water a day to basically just get by. Okay, 100 waters to replace what's used in a given day for you. Now, if you're hyperactive, you're an athlete, you're out in the field, you're farming, et cetera, you're going to need way more than half your body weight in ounces. You'll know that. But just say 100, 100 ounces a day, right? Then what can we do? We can quantify that. Let's say we get a 50 ounce water bottle, okay? And we have one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So you only have to physically think of two different times that you have to focus on refilling that water bottle. It's less stressful. It's right out in front of you. So you know when you do your lunch break, evaluate how your water intake was for the morning. If you have the same amount of water that you had when you started the day, then you did a pretty terrible job. Make sure that you get that water made up for in the afternoon, right? So it, it allows it when you can quantify it like that. It doesn't seem so difficult to do. It seems pretty darn easy and it really truly is. All right, just finding something that I try to look around if I have my water bottle, but I don't, I don't have it on me right now. It's in the, the uh, kitchen, but still, so trying to quantify the water intake. If we're not drinking enough water, we're dehydrated. If we're dehydrated, we're going to have issues with our stool. We're going to have dehydrated stool. We can be more inflamed and that can cause some constipation and it can even trickle in and cause some diarrhea if we are too dehydrated. Um, that's where a lot of people with stomach bugs, et cetera, they'll have diarrhea and it'll pull all the water out of them and then it'll be dehydrated. So that's one thing. Your NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can cause irritable bowel, antihistamines. Okay. A lot of people with these allergy medications are going to cause horrible stomach issues, horrible digestive issues. And then that's going to lead into more irritable bowel. And then it's this vicious cycle because a lot of allergies can be corrected by fixing the immune system down in the gut. I'm going to stop there. A lot of allergies can be corrected, can be fixed by fixing that microbiome. Fix the gut. The allergies are less responsive. Okay. And if you need help with allergies, like I can't deal with it. Just go on our website, go on our, find us on Instagram go to our little supplement store and get Hista Ease. It's designed to reduce histamine response or negate the histamine response. Kids can use it. Adults can use it, et cetera. But that's a, still going to be a band-aid repair while we're working on the underlying cause. Moving on, antidepressants or tricyclics. Antidepressants, there's a whole plethora of people who are on antidepressants and have horrible bowel issues. I had a patient back in Pittsburgh who was dealing with issues with this and they came off their antidepressants and their, their bowels were all over the place. He had yeast overgrowth. It was, a, it was a mess and it was all due to those antidepressants. So be aware of that when you're on these medications, which most people are, don't be surprised if you develop irritable bowel, whether it's now or 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years from now. We have uh, urinary incontinence medications, iron supplements. So a lot of people are like, oh, I think I'm deficient in iron. So they take a bunch of iron and then it constipates them. Like, how did that happen? Too much iron will constipate you, guaranteed. Blood pressure medications, anti-nausea medications, type of blood lowering medication called calcium channel blockers linked to increased risk of irritable bowel and diverticulitis. So calcium channel blockers, which a lot of people are on, can cause diverticulitis. A lot of people have diverticulitis. I would wonder how many of them are taking one of those calcium channel blockers. Maybe more, more than you think. We say all this, we say all the negatives that are kind of wrapped up into this, but what, what do we do with this information? If you're out there and you're like, man, I still, what, great information, but I still have irritable bowel. What the heck do I do? So we start with some of those simple things, right? Increase your water intake. All right, get at least half your body weight in ounces. Try that for your first week of fixing your gut. Get, just get your water intake in. Then that second week is going to be the harder week. Get out the gluten, corn, dairy, soy. Avoid it completely. Do that for a week. That's your second step. Now, doing it for a week doesn't mean after a week, throw it back in. It just means that's what we're focusing on the second week. After that, once we start getting that under control, we'll start feeling better. Now assess your relationships. Are there boundaries that you need to put up? Family members, loved ones, spouses, kids, because <laughs> kids will run us into the ground. We love them, but they'll run us into the ground. What about work stress? What about, you know, saying no to things? Again, I had a patient yesterday that phenomenal patient. Her whole family is fantastic. And she was like, I'm having such a hard time saying no to people. And that's the, the bad thing. It's like the blessing and the curses. So when you're feeling great, 
people start to leech off you and try to get you to do stuff for them, right? It's like the moving example. Like, <laughs> it's pretty intimate when someone's like, hey, can you help me move? You're like, oof, we better have been friends for at least 15 years before you asked me to do that. Like, that's pretty intense. There's a Seinfeld episode on it that's also pretty, <laughs> it's pretty funny if anybody's watched Seinfeld. I'd say it shows my age, but it doesn't because I'm not that old. No offense, mom and dad, but it's an older people show and I thoroughly enjoy it. It's, it's hilarious, right? So assess those things, assess your relationships, assess your boundaries. Okay. That's on week three there. And then week four, okay. Week four, focus on some of the other things that we've mentioned. Are you on any medications that could be causing these problems? All right. And if so, we need to talk to your doc. You need to talk to your doctor about this. Now, I can't tell you to get on or off of a medication, but what I can tell you is that your body didn't have that symptom because you lacked that medication. How do I know that? If you come off of that medication, what happens? Your body resumes function the way that it was when you started the medication to begin with. If you have high blood pressure, you're on blood pressure medications, and then you pump off the blood pressure medications. If you don't fix that underlying cause, your blood pressure is going to go up again. And they're like, oh, we need to put you back on that blood pressure medication because it's still high, right? We need to fix these problems. So that's a four week, that's like a month plan for you. Like, what do I do? Try those things, right? If you want to go all in and you're like, well, Dr. Jock, how do you approach this? How do you get results where other systems have failed? And by other systems, I mean, basically every other freaking system has failed. What do I do? We test properly. Okay, now we talked about the nutrition piece of it. Now there's things that you can do. Sometimes there are a lot more user unfriendly versions where if you try to do the elimination diet, it's very effective, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to do. So my replacement for that is I would do a food sensitivity panel on you. Figure out what foods your bodies have a negative response to, and then we pull those out. That's concrete evidence. That's it. It's right there. Now, if you're still eating things and say, you know, dairy didn't show up, cow's milk didn't show up on that food sensitivity test, but every time you eat something with cheese or dairy, et cetera, if it smells like you can clear an entire, you know, stadium with your gas, you're probably lactose intolerant, right? So food sensitivities are different from intolerances. So you can still have intolerances that are not sensitivities. Okay. So we can build into that. And so that way you have more confidence going into your removal program, right? Which gets us to the first phase of care, but I'll explain that in a minute. So we either eliminate those foods, eliminate the inflammatory foods, eliminate the intolerances, eliminate the sensitivities. And then what do we do? What are the two main tests that I would do for somebody who's suffering with an irritable bile type condition? I would do a neuroendocrine panel. So do either salivary saliva, um, <laughs> salivary saliva, salivary adrenals, or do a Dutch plus test, depending on what the hormonal presentation is a history of PCOS, endometriosis, et cetera. I want to see what those other hormones look like because there's certain things that I can't give you like DHEA that you may need, but you can't use because you're over converting DHEA to an uh, androgen or again, feeding too much down to the estrogen, right? So do one of those panels, salivary adrenals or Dutch plus, Dutch plus is urine and salivary adrenals combined. That's what the plus is. And then you're going to do a stool test. It's pretty obvious. Now people were like, well, I've done tons of stool tests before. I've done so many. I've, I've had this, I've rolled out this bug and I've rolled out that one. I'm like, I don't care. I don't, unless they've run a GI map on you, I don't care what the result was on the previous test. And here's why. This is from my experience. I've run many, many, many different versions of stool tests on patients, on myself and every Every stool test that I rule out to patients, I get my own vote of approval first. So I always run it on myself before I pull it out to the patients or I put it out to the patients. So we used to use doctor's data, which I hate their panels. A lot of them are culture panels. So they're trying to basically just culture out the stool to see what infections are in there. It misses a ton. It misses so much. Okay. And then you go to, I, I did um, a neural zoomer from Vibrant. Now, Vibrant we use for some blood panels, but their neural zoomer is not great, in my opinion. It's kind of chaotic, more chaos. Um, doesn't give you that concrete readout. It's not easy. It's not user-friendly. I don't like it. It's not a good panel. Ran that on myself, read it. I'm like, that's bullshit. None of that's true. Ran a GI map, got my answers, right? GI maps are phenomenal because 
one of the most common infections that we treat is Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. And I've had people take all of those other tests, do the add-on tests, do medical tests, and they're like, there's no H. pylori. There's no H. pylori present at all. We test them and they're through the roof with H. pylori. And they're like, well, all these other tests said we didn't have it. I'm like, yeah, I know. I went through that myself. I had H. pylori. I was running all these other panels, but I never got a positive find on H. pylori. So that GI map is where it's at. That's why it's the only one that I'll, I'll suggest to do. Now, there, there may be other extenuating circumstances where I say, okay, we've got that panel done. We could potentially run this one, but anybody that's worked with me knows that the GI map is going to give just a plethora of information and things that we need to work on that make a massive improvement in someone's health, right? So we test food, the adrenals and hormones, stool, and then we address it, right? Then we address your lifestyle, we address your diet, we build out a protocol for you that's gonna supplement into your current lifestyle. Now supplements are designed to supplement your current state of health, okay, your current lifestyle. So these aren't things that you should be on for the rest of your life. So when we go through these different programs, what we start with is gonna be the removal program. This is the hardest part of the entire program. <laughs> and by hardest part, not for me, but for patients, because it means you can't eat shit. You can't eat horrible foods, right? Because when you come to me, you come to me with your current lifestyle, your current habits, your current stresses, your current lifestyle, your current sleep schedule, your current everything. Then my job as your practitioner is to correct any imbalances that I'm able to pinpoint through a proper health history and then from what my tests show as well. So we remove the stresses, we remove the inflammatory foods, we remove the sensitivities, and then we remove any infections that are being found in your gut. That's the first phase that we jump into, okay? So we do the removal phase. After we remove and we kill whatever we need to remove those inflammatory foods, your body is in a better state of health, we move into what's known as replace. Now, replace is one of the most commonly misunderstood and missed portions of healing the gut. I was a part of organizations that had no freaking clue about the replace phase, which it's comical to me now that these guys grew as big as they did. They're kind of moronical. But anyways, the replace phase is why we typically get infections to begin with. Okay, so when we replace, one of the most important things that we're replacing is going to be your stomach acid. Now, a lot of people have the assumption because the commercials tell us so that we're used to being walking fireballs of inflammation in our guts, right? We have too much acid. That's why we have acid reflux. That's why we have GERD. That's why we have these conditions. No, it's not true. The reason we typically have the initial symptom could be because too much stomach acid, but then you get suppressed, right? And when we think about what suppresses stomach acid, it's, I mean, it's a no brainer that we're walking around all inflamed in our stomachs, right? Antacids are another thing that can throw off digestive health. NSAIDs can throw off the stomach there too. The antacids basically buffers down the acid in your stomach from a pH of two to you know potentially like seven, eight, etc. That also gets into the stupid freaking alkaline waters. I don't believe in them. I don't buy them. They're they're garbage in my opinion because uh, your body's going to have to try to recalibrate in the stomach and it's not good. All right, fix the problem. Gluten is going to decrease your stomach acid stress decrease stomach acid. So you're left in this hypochlorhydric state where we have too little stomach acid, where we go achlorhydro, we don't have any at all. And then we can't break down food. We can't sterilize the food. So we're going to get parasites, we're going to get yeast, we're going to get bacteria that we're going to take in from our food, we'll get more E. coli, more, I don't know, blastocyst hominis, you know, just different parasites are just going to hop in there because they can easily slide through a stomach that's not doing its job. That's also where we're going to have a lot of foods that we need to eliminate and avoid because there's going to be higher rates of food sensitivities because we're throwing giant chunks of food down into the digestive tract, down in the small and large intestines. So the stomach aspect of it is going to be huge. We need to replace that stomach aspect, but we need to make sure that we do it properly. The other thing that drives me crazy is the people who are just trying to automatically supplement the stomach acid without properly analyzing the stool first. If you have an H. pylori infection, which I almost guarantee you do if you're listening to this, you probably do unless you've treated with me already and you know you don't. If you try to raise stomach acid with H. pylori, you're going to piss off your stomach. You're going to have a fireball. It's going to hurt like crazy and you're going to be pounding down tongues because you're going to have too much acid that's going to be produced. Right? H. pylori is seen in 80% of stomach ulcer cases. So if you're throwing acid in there on top of slits in your stomach, 
It's going to fucking burn. Pardon my French. It's going to burn. So what do we have to do? Again, recognize what we're doing and then bring that stomach acid up at the proper time. Right. And there's times where you will have H. pylori. We'll, we'll do the removal phase for a couple months. We'll try to remove that H. pylori. Then we'll go into the replace phase. And then the replace phase causes that inflammation to, to kick in and hit. And we're like, whoop, time out. You still have some of that H. pylori in there. So we're going to buffer out that H. pylori, get that thing out. And then we're going to try again in a month to get that replace phase back in. Okay? It doesn't mean that if you try, if you try taking betaine, and it's inflammatory that you have H. pylori. It's not like a causation like that, but there's a very, very uh, common correlation between the two of them, okay? So you replace. After you replace, another thing that the medical doctors always screw up is the repopulation or re-inoculation where we're putting in more proper bacteria. You know, do we need more polyphenols, red polyphenols to allow for acromancia growth? Because again, antibiotic antifungal usage can reduce our good bacteria when acromancia goes low, we can trigger things like ulcerative colitis. There's some irritable bowel, right? So do we need to eat more red things, strawberries, pomegranates, cranberries to bring up those polyphenols? Do we need more prebiotics? Do we need prebiotic fiber? Do we need probiotics because you just don't have anything overall? What does your gut microbiome look like? For the people who are just randomly taking probiotics all the time, it's not that that's a bad thing, but you really shouldn't have to take probiotics for life. You should be able to have your gut maintain proper gut health with what you eat on a daily basis. Again, going back to the fiber and the prebiotic type of food. What happens after re-inoculation, repopulation is we work to repair. So remove, replace, repopulate, repair. This is another one that not many people know about. This is where we use things like L-glutamine in massive doses. And people are like, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, a tablespoon twice a day is a lot of the L-glutamine. Why? Because when you're stressed, when you're damaged and you're inflamed, your body will destroy your glutamine in your gut and use it elsewhere. So you have to replenish it. And that also helps to rebuild the intestinal tract lining. So that way it reduces gut permeability. You need to put in some anti-inflammatory things, some fish oils, different vitamins, nutrients, et cetera, to build up some zinc in there to build up your intestinal health. Okay. And in that replace phase, I got there, forgot to mention that we also replace and rebuild that immune system. So do you need some immunoglobulins? Do you need some IgGs to push up your secretory IgA because it showed low on your stool test, right? And I want this information to be simple, yet overwhelming. And also kind of like, I want it to tick you off a little bit because I shouldn't be the only one talking about this stuff. And I know a couple of docs, you know, that I train with or listen to, you know, Hyman talks about this. Dr. Kalish talks about this. My good friend, Dr. Landy, that I, that I taught, I'm so proud of him. He talks about this, but there's very few other people that I'm aware of that talk about this stuff. And your GI specialist should sure as shit know about this stuff, right? The four R's is functional medicine. There's, there's medical doctors who are functional medicine practitioners who are still giving antibiotics, which I don't agree with at all, but they at least know the four R's. They know that after they damage the gut, they have to fix it. Otherwise, you're going to be more susceptible to infections to begin with. And so when we embark on these journeys, we're trying to fix our gut. If we miss any of these steps, you're never going to be healed. Or you may feel good, and then you go right back to where you came from. That's where testing and retesting comes into play. There's a lot of infections that can, can go dormant in terms of symptoms. But unless you retest it to confirm that it's gone... You don't know. You don't know if it's completely eradicated. And H. pylori is one of them. H. pylori can go subclinical, which means it doesn't cause any symptoms at all. You get through all of the phases and you're like, I feel fantastic. And then we retest your stool and you have a little bit of H. pylori left. Now, I battle with other practitioners. I talked with Dr. Kalish about this too. And there's a, um, I think it was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, did a study on H. pylori and said H. pylori any concentration at all is detrimental to human health. So even if it's just 230 units, like 2.00 E2, on a test, it won't flag as high, but you're like, oh, it's still kind of there. Wait until that next round of stress comes in and then it activates it. It makes the, the H. pylori get stronger. Then you're feeling more symptoms. You're feeling worse. And then all of a sudden you're like, where did that come from? Well, he had an infection. It wasn't fully eradicated. He did a good job. It's lowered, but it's not fully gone. 
So test, retest, make sure the infection is gone. Okay. These are just some of the simple things that you can do for an irritable bowel case, whether irritable bowel syndrome, irritable bowel disease, Crohn's, colitis. And I want this to be enraging in that you should be pissed off if you've been to a GI doc and they have never mentioned any of this, never mentioned the testing, never mentioned the stress connection to this, never mentioned reducing foods or reducing dairy, et cetera. And you're just sitting there taking medications or immunosuppressants Right? What's, what's going to be your, your state of health in 10 years? You're going to be horrible. Nobody gets better while on medications for irritable bowel. It's impossible. Right? We talk in autoimmunity, we talk colitis. Right? We're going to throw an immunosuppressant. So we're going to suppress the immune system. Right? And any immunosuppressant or immunomodulator, but immunosuppressant is going to say new or worsening symptoms or infections new infections, new or worsening infections. And at first, like, ah, whatever, like, I, I, my immune system is strong. No, it's not. You're literally telling your immune system to go to sleep. Don't do anything. I've, I've got this under control. I'm taking this. So then it's going to push down your secretory IgA, right? So your immune system is going to be low. So any infection that you do come across, which we come across them all the time, is then going to be able to take root in our gut, and then it's going to cause an infection. Normal medical treatment. Oh, you have an infection. You test it positive for fill in the blank. I'm going to give you medications. Medications are going to crush your probiotics again, push it down into a state of dis-ease in the gut. We may eradicate the infection, but the rest of the body has just been carpet bombed by an antibiotic, right? But you're still on those medications. So then what happens? Next season, you get another infection and it's a worse infection than what you had previously because now it's a super bug because you took an antibiotic that didn't fully kill it. You just pissed it off and now you have a super bug. Now they're like, well, this, this isn't working. We gave you one round here. It came back. So let's do two things. Let's do three things. Let's do four things. This isn't unheard of, especially when it comes to H. pylori. It's, it's comical. H. pylori is hard to kill. There's so many different facets. It's, it's contagious. It's activated by stress, low stomach acid, gluten, diet. I mean, it's, it's hard to get rid of. However, when you throw three medications, right? They used to do triple antibiotic therapy for H. pylori. Now they've upgraded to quadruple antibiotic therapy to try to kill H. pylori. And they're terrible at it. I've had so many patients come to me post-treatment for H. pylori. The doctor says it's completely gone. We retest them and H. pylori is through the roof. And they may have a virulence factor, which makes it even more aggressive. <laughs> like, they didn't do anything but destroyed your gut. Let's, let's rebuild. Okay, so start simple. If you're listening to this and you're like, I'm so overwhelmed right now, good. Listen to this again. Start simple. Do the little four week protocol that I built out for you, right? Remove those foods, figure out those stresses, figure out those medications, make sure you put those boundaries in. I know that's not the exact order that just came to me. I spit it out there, but do that. Go back and listen to what those, the four week built out was. That's the first time I've ever mentioned it like that. Do it. That's free for you to do, free dollars and free cents. If after a month you don't feel great or you feel better, but not quite as good as you want, then reach out, book a call with me and we'll figure out. Because if you do 30 days of what I just kind of built out there for you, you're going to be so much stronger to enter into my program because my programs are not easy. My programs are full overhauls of what your life is currently like. You will never be able to go back to life to <laughs> you. You should never go back to the life that you brought into my office or the lifestyle that you brought into my office. Otherwise, you're going to build that same disease. Example, patient, I won't say from where, <laughs> had a patient um, who had ulcerative colitis, was having blood, mucus, I mean, just wrecking her, her young little body. Her mom brought her into me and we fixed her up in like three months or so. Got and Fixed her up. We got her feeling really good. And about three months or so, then she went to college, started drinking and eating shit again. Came back that Christmas and was like, hey, all my symptoms came back. And you're like, why didn't, this, why didn't the, the results stick? I'm like, what do you mean? It's like you got pissed off because you had all the ingredients to make a cake. And I told you, hey, we don't want to make a cake. We want to make you know, a nice organic, healthy meal, some veggies and things like that. And you put all the ingredients to the cake together and you put it in the oven and you pull it out and you're like, wait a second, I have cake again. 
Well, you put all the ingredients in to make that cake. Just like you put all those ingredients into your body to make colitis, you did it to yourself. I can't stop what you put in your mouth. I can try to coach you on it. I mean, diet is very emotional for a lot of people. There's a lot of societal pressures on how to eat or what to eat that are all fallacies. A lot of people are really wrong with what to eat. And I know that it could be overwhelming. But if you if you go back to the same lifestyle that you brought into the office, my results will never stick with you. Now, they, they might for a couple months, a year, two years or so down the line. But if you go right back to drinking all the time, eating gluten all the time, dairy all the time, sugar all the time, you're going to put on a bunch of weight. You're going to be tired, fat, inflamed. And you're going to be like, what happened? to my body or, or what I hear a lot, that didn't work for me. So I need to find something else. Did, did the protocol not work for you or did you not work for you? Which is a whole nother podcast that I, I will be doing as well. So start simple, start with a four week little program there to try to eliminate those things out of your diet. So start with those, those four weeks, eliminate things out. Let me know, just shoot me a DM on Instagram, say, Hey, I did those things for the last four weeks. I feel great. I feel terrible. I feel the same. Just let me know. Let me know that you tried it and then use it as like an accountability thing too. Or you can, you can message me beforehand and say, hey, Dr. Jock, I want to let you know that I'm doing this for the next four weeks. I'll message you in four weeks from now and let you know my experience, right? Where you tell me, which is like telling a friend, right? Hey, I'm doing this, which helps to hold you accountable for it. And I'm not going to be messaging you every day to say, make sure you eat healthy. But you know that in four weeks, you're supposed to message back out to me, reach back out to me and say, hey, I felt this way, I felt that way, etc. Right? And eventually what we'll end up doing is we're going to build some little four week programs to be able to make an impact on you. So like how to do these things, I'll have videos, webinars, etc. Where I explain things to you, I explain the why, nutritional plans, elimination diet plans. So also, or and also, if you're interested in some of those things, put a fire under my butt, shoot me a DM and say, hey, I would love for you to build a 30 day gut reset or 20 day or three month, whatever, whatever you're looking for, let me know and I'll see if I can craft something out for you. Now it won't be free because I'll put I'm gonna be putting a lot of time and effort into it. But it'll be much cheaper than than getting in with me, you know, I charge a higher rate because I get higher quality results. So if you want to go the cheaper route and you wanted to do something small, just do the four week thing. It costs you again, $0. And then if you want to do some of the testing, you're more than welcome to as well. That's going to be a little bit more expensive, but you're going to get a lot more results from that too. So whatever that is, whatever your gut looks like now, hopefully in four weeks from listening to this podcast, you'll make some of these changes and you'll feel like a completely different person and you'll understand why I am as passionate as I am about what you put in your mouth, food, medications, water, air, everything that we put in here, we have to be mindful of. So thank you for listening and watching today. And I'll, uh, I'll see you next time.